My name is Leilani Munter. Hi, Leilani. Nice to meet you. I am a professional race car driver and an environmentalist. Now I know what you're thinking. Race car driving is far from eco-friendly. I completely agree, and that is exactly what I intend to change. I've always felt the need to go fast. When I was a little girl, it was horses. But then, I got behind the wheel of a car. This is the thing about racing, is it is so addictive. At the age of 16, I received a letter from the state of Arizona saying that I was a danger to society after receiving an excessive number of speeding tickets. Apparently, they didn't appreciate my talent. They threatened to take my license away, I think, within a year of me getting my license. So I always was sort of racy. I always wanted to race people on the street. So I saved my money and went to racing school. I was the only female in the class. I, you know, I lost positions on the restart, but I was picking people off. I mean, I felt so good. My car was so solid. Being a female in a male-dominated sport, I sometimes get extra attention. You have that stereotype of, you know, is she here for drive or is she just here she's cute and somebody wants to use her as a publicity stunt. And people aren't always happy about it. I did have a driver once and kind of get in my face and yell at me. He was really angry because all of the TV networks had come down to interview me. And he kind of was like, you know, I've been racing here for 10 years and I've never had them come down here and interview me. What's so special about you? As I continue to prove myself in the Indy Pro Series, many of my critics will find themselves in the rear view. But there will always be those who suggest I maintain a low profile, especially off the track. But unfortunately, that is just not possible. Even as a child, I was in love with nature. I could never understand how people could be so abusive to something so beautiful. And yet I didn't understand the severity of what lied ahead and the role I would eventually play in trying to make a difference. Then my sister Natasha married a musician named Bob Weir. He played in a band you might have heard of called The Grateful Dead. Bob was also passionate about protecting the environment, and he used his celebrity to actually make a difference. It was then that I realized that my love for driving and my love for nature were meant to intersect. So every time I run a race in the Indy Pro Series, I buy an acre of rainforest, of endangered rainforest to protect, to sort of offset the carbon footprint that I'm making by racing the car. I almost got hit by a butterfly. <laughs> I've now become politically active, challenging the leaders in my sport and on Capitol Hill to act now, to make the changes necessary to save our planet before it's too late. People are beginning to listen, but there is still so much work to be done, and I have to do my part.
corporate America and break new ground in bringing environmental sponsors to my sport. I will meet with other drivers one at a time, pleading with them to join me in the fight to bring all of American motorsports into a new era with the use of alternative fuels. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's really an honor to be here to speak with you today. Uh, you just got to see a glimpse of my driving experiences, and I've been lucky enough in my lifetime to drive some pretty cool cars. But I have to admit that after going into to corners at entry speeds of over 200 miles an hour, I didn't think that I could ever get excited about a street car again. <laughs> Thanks to Tesla Motors, I stand corrected. It's, uh, it's worth noting that the first time I ever drove a Tesla, it was Chris Payne's Silver Roadster for a film called Revenge of the Electric Car. And within just a few minutes, I found myself speaking to the police. <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> that was a fun day. This is the first time in my life that I've been in love with a car that's not one of my race cars. I feel okay talking like that today because I know that I'm surrounded by people that feel the same way that I do. People who understand that Tesla is more than just a car. This is a revolution of the automotive industry, the beginning of a declaration of independence from fossil fuels. <laughs> I'm glad it's happening in my lifetime, and I'm glad that I'm here to witness it. It's really a privilege that we are getting to be a part of this movement. By driving, owning, and being champions for Tesla, we are doing our small part to change the world, and Tesla couldn't have made it more fun to drive this kind of change. I know when you saw me on the list for today, some of you maybe were wondering how a race car driver could be an environmental activist. But before I was a driver, I was actually a biology graduate from the University of California in San Diego. And I'm really just your typical composting, rainwater collecting, vegetarian hippie chick. <laughs> I just happen to drive race cars. ESPN magazine once called me the oxymoron, the tree-hugging race car driver. I'm an uncommon messenger in the environmental world, I know that. But I recently came across a quote by Earl Bakken that helped make, me make some sense of it for me. He said, By all reckoning, the bumblebee is unsound and should not be able to fly. Yet the little bee gets those wings going like a turbojet and flies to every little pant, it, plant its chubby little body can land on to collect all the nectar it can hold. Bumblebees are the most persistent creatures. They don't know they can't fly, so they just keep buzzing around. So much like the chubby bumblebee, I'm a race car driver that doesn't know I can't be an environmental activist. So I just keep buzzing around. My long, strange journey began with an accidental meeting at a racetrack and a stroke of luck. After graduating from college, I began working as a photo double for actress Catherine Zeta-Jones, and I used the money I made working for her to enroll in a racing school. Although I did not know it, while I was taking those very first laps around the track, there was a race team owner sitting in the stands watching me drive. He asked me if I had any interest in becoming a professional driver, and I explained that I didn't have the kind of money that it takes to be a race car driver. But he pointed out to me that not only did I have the fastest time that day, but I was also the only female driver. You might have a chance, because that makes you different, he said. I think you should give it a shot. It took 15 minutes in that short conversation with a complete stranger about my potential and his vision of what I could become to change the course of my life forever. 
It took a lot of really hard work, a lot of phone calls, a lot of sponsor kits that ended up in the garbage can probably before they were even looked at. I had a thousand doors slam in my face, but every time I got knocked down, I stood back up again, knocked the dust off my pants, and I went on to knock on the next door. Eventually, nine months later, I heard my very first yes, and I ran my very first race. And when I heard the track announcer say, lady and gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I had already won, no matter where I finished in the race. Like any great love story, it didn't take long for me to fall. After my first two races, I decided to pour my heart and soul into becoming a prof professional driver. And when I broke the bad news to my family, I remember my father looking at me in a very serious tone, asking me if this meant that graduate school was out of the question. <laughs> and it was. So I packed up my little Volkswagen and I moved to North Carolina, which is the epicenter of NASCAR racing. I had no job, no race car, no race team, no sponsor, and I didn't know a single person in the state. All I had was my racing helmet and my health. I was definitely the odd one out. Not only was I a female driver in a male-dominated sport, but I was also what seemed like the only vegetarian in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I had more than a few people in NASCAR actually tell me they thought that this was why I was so short. The lack of meat in my diet had stunted my growth. <laughs> It's safe to say that it was difficult for some of the old school NASCAR boys to take seriously a vegetarian female driver as a competitor, but it was about to get worse. Soon it was not just my diet and my gender that was setting me apart from the rest of the racing community. Over the years, I've become increasingly concerned, like many others, about the damage that's being done to our environment. In 2006, I took my personal concerns public when I started a section on my website dedicated to environmental news. And in 2007, I announced my commitment to adopt and protect an acre of rainforest for every race that I run to offset the carbon footprint. Offsetting isn't a solution, but I had to do something about the unavoidable emissions of my car. The more that I learned about our environmental challenges, the more my racing website became covered in eco facts about renewable energy, alternative fuels, electric cars, uh, green buildings, and environmental legislation. And the reaction that I got from the racing community and the general public was strong from both sides of the fence. I remember coming across an or argument on a NASCAR forum in 2006. One member of the forum was very annoyed that I was promoting a movie called An Inconvenient Truth on my website. He called me all kinds of names and said that I was brainwashed by Al Gore. Others chimed in to agree. Another member questioned him how he could judge the movie if he hadn't actually seen it. The thread became very long and people were posting back and forth. Some of them liked me, some of them hated me, but both sides were posting with passion. And when I got past the personal attacks on myself, I sat back and I thought, wow, I just started an argument about climate change on a NASCAR forum. <laughs> I guarantee you this was the first time the people on that forum argued about the parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And that made me smile. I had started a dialogue, and that's the first step in creating change, to start a dialogue between the two sides. And that very simple thing became something very important to me. I had become a bridge between the environmentalists and the race fans, and even if some people didn't like me for it, what was happening on that forum was bigger than my racing career. I began lobbying for clean energy on Capitol Hill. I made three trips to Taiji, Japan, documenting the horrific dolphin slaughter that is exposed in the Oscar-winning documentary, The Cove. I made two trips to the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And while I was there, I experienced a life-changing moment. 10 days after the Deepwater Horizon sank, I was in a small boat 75 miles away from the sunken rig, and I saw an unbelievable sight. There was crude oil floating from horizon to horizon for as far as the eye could see. Dead animals were floating in the oil, and it knocked the wind out of me. And from that moment on, I knew that I would never again buy a gasoline-powered car. My transition was complete. I had become an activist. I was told by many people in the racing world 
that I was making a big mistake, that as a driver I needed to shut up, drive the race car, and plug my sponsors. Marketing people warned me that by talking about political and environmental issues, I would alienate myself from companies that might want to sponsor my race car. Companies with CEOs that might not believe in climate change. And you know what I told them? I said the same thing that I said years earlier to the people that told me girls can't drive race cars. I said, screw you, watch me. I had made a very important decision and that was that I was going to talk about what I believed in even if it landed me on the sidelines of the racetrack. I had finally made it to a level in my sport where my races were airing on TV and I had an audience. And I knew I would be a fool to waste that opportunity. So if a sponsor didn't want to work with me because I promoted recycling and caring about the planet, then thanks but no thanks. I don't want you on my race car anyway. And after I drew that line in the sand, something really interesting started to happen. I started to get calls from people who believed in the same things that I did. And in 2007, when I became the fourth woman in history to race in the Indy Pro Series, I had a company named Smart Papers on my race car. They are a leader in the recycled paper industry. <laughs> I've raced for Operation Free, a coalition of veterans securing America with clean energy and getting the message out that our billion dollar a day habit on foreign oil is a national security threat to our country. At Daytona this year, I was honored to drive the first ever ocean awareness race car carrying the colors of the Oscar winning documentary, The Cove. So my race car has now become a 200 mile per hour billboard to advertise not products, but instead promoting shifts in our behavior for the future of our planet and our species. A couple years ago, one of my sponsors, Renewable Energy, Native Energy, was criticized for their support. A disgruntled customer wrote on their company website, you're promoting race car driving? Tom Rawls, the Vice President of Marketing, responded on their website by saying this. How does Native Energy reach people who are not already converts on the issue of climate change? Anyone who is engaged in any broad effort to speak to the public faces this question. Do I speak to only friendly audiences or do I face the doubters and the hostiles? If we only address those who already believe in what we do, then nothing changes. And if we only work with people who already agree with us, then who is going to change the minds of those who don't? So this is my call to action for everyone here. I want all of us to start thinking outside the box and instead of talking to each other, we have to go out and talk with people who are not on board yet. It's a more difficult conversation to have, but it is also the most important conversation because this is how we create change. This is how we move the needle. And I've seen this change firsthand. I've had lifelong NASCAR fans ask me, how do you go about adopting your acre of rainforest? I couldn't think of what to get my wife for her birthday. And I thought it might be cool to adopt an acre of rainforest in her name. Just because these fans love racing doesn't mean that they don't care about the earth. More than most, I think, the people in this room understand that liking cars and caring about the environment are not mutually exclusive events. Tesla is the perfect car for this demographic. They were built for people like us, people who don't believe that a car is just a way to get from point A to point B. No way, we wanna have fun getting from point A to point B. And now we can do it without burning fossil fuels. It doesn't get any better than that. So why is reaching race fans important? Because racing is the number one spectator sport in America. It's number two on television, second only to the NFL. More people tune in to watch racing than watch baseball, basketball, and hockey combined. And of the 18 out of 20 top attended sporting events in the United States are auto races. One is the Indy 500 and the other 17 are NASCAR races. Nearly one in three Americans considers themselves a race fan, which is also why more Fortune 500 companies sponsor NASCAR than any other sport. So I'm now on a mission to green my sport. I'm hopeful that with a growing number of companies adopting green programs, that I will be able to find the corporate partners to help me continue using my race car to call to action millions of fans and get them to rethink their day-to-day -day habits for our planet. 
It's my 200 mile per hour eco awareness program. And each time my, hit, my race car hits the track, I will send an environmental call to action to the fans because small changes, when multiplied by millions, make a big difference. I hope that my efforts will encouraging the racing san encourage the racing sanctioning bodies to increase their environmental initiatives, and I will not stop until I see every racetrack with a recycling program, every sponsor taking responsibility for their effect on the environment, every racing tire recycled, and every race car abandoning fossil fuels for electricity or renewables. This is my mission, and some people think I'm crazy. And I know this because they send me emails. <laughs> but when I get discouraged, I remember these words from an old Apple Think Different commercial. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the one thing that you cannot do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward and while some may see them as crazy, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. You will probably find as I have that the more that you learn, the more your eyes open to your impact and the impact of everyone around you and your awareness will be both a blessing and a curse. But with that burden of knowing comes a responsibility to educate those around you whose eyes have not opened yet. Charles Darwin once said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor is it the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. And so in the spirit of Charles Darwin, it is time for us to utilize our intelligence to adapt and to change the way that we are living and driving. This generation has been called upon to answer the most noble of duties, to ensure the survival of future generations by using the most basic of survival mechanisms, adaptation. And by being here today, I know that you guys are all a part of this evolution. This morning, I made another big step in my own evolution. I know that the kind of life that I choose to lead is defined by the moral choices that I make every single day and I want to make choices that I'm proud of. The first thing that I did when I got out of bed this morning was write a Dear John letter of sorts. It went like this. Dear Oil, I am breaking up with you. <laughs> it's not me, it's you. <laughs> no, I don't want to be friends. Please don't call me, ever. And then I signed on to teslamotors.com and I ordered my Model S. <laughs> From this day forward, I will never again own a car that burns fossil fuels. This is a choice that I can be proud of. As an environmentalist, driving fast cars has always been my guilty pleasure. And now for the first time in my life, <laughs> I can finally drive without guilt, the guilt of burning fossil fuels. And now the only time that I'll stop at gas stations is if I feel like flipping them off. <laughs> Beyond my personal Tesla next year, you will also see me driving a very special Model S on the silver screen in a new film from the Academy Award winning team that made The Cove. I can't reveal much more than that because this is a top secret Ocean's Eleven kind of mission that we're on. And those of you who saw the cove will understand what I'm talking about. But what I can tell you is that this is a one of a kind Model S. There is not another car of any kind like it on the planet. And I can't wait for you guys to see what we're up to. You're gonna love it. Since being welcomed into this Tesla family and joining the forums and connecting with some of you on social media, I've been blown away by the effect that this car has on people. I saw it firsthand on the faces of North Carolina lawmakers when I was lobbying them to not restrict Tesla's right to sell cars in my state. I watched grown senators turn into teenage boys behind the wheel of the Model S. <laughs> Thank you.
I saw it on the face of my sister who has always been a cars are a way to get from point A to point B kind of person. And yet, after I brought her to Menlo Park for a test drive, she promptly ordered herself an S and then began to text me, counting down the days till her car arrived. Six more days, she would text me. I see the excitement all over the forums and in some hilarious comments. There was one particular thread that caught my eye and it really summed up the Tesla phenomenon for me. The person that started the thread on teslamitters.com called it Tesla psychosis. <laughs> some of you know this thread. It was written by a man in Europe who was anxiously awaiting the arrival of his Model S. He contemplated his addiction to all things Tesla and then concluded, I'm buying into more than a car here. I'm buying into an entire philosophy. He asked the other members of the forum if his obsession would pass once his car was delivered. <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then his post took on a more serious note when he wrote this. Something else struck me when I ordered my Model S. One of my kids died a few years ago and life has been nothing but grim since. Losing her took all the joy out of life, all the color out of living. Ordering the Model S has woken in me a sense of excitement that I'd forgotten existed. So I'm indulging in my obsession. It may be some kind of psychosis, but I say, bring it on. The forum responded with pages of support and reassurance that his obsession was normal, and that they too had it, and that it would not go away once his car was delivered, but would in fact get even worse. <laughs> Here were some of the replies. We are all so emotionally invested here because Tesla is about hope. We all instinctively feel it. A new and better time is beginning. This car is absolutely a life-changing event. I have never felt anything for any auto that I have owned until the Tesla. The Model S is the best therapy that money can buy. Tesla is about hope for a better future for our children. I never imagined spending this much on a car, but this is more than a car. This is hope. This car, this company, and its vision means a lot to me. And some of the comments in the obsession were a little more comical, like this short comment. All I can say is that I sat in the car, in the garage, for an hour, the first <laughs> night that I had it, Mike. <laughs> some people may think we are crazy. All this fuss over a car. And maybe we are, just a little. But we know that this is about something much deeper than a car company. Our Teslas are a way for us to tell the rest of the world there is a better way. I couldn't be happier to be a part of this crazy family of ours. I'm glad that Tesla psychosis is real, spreading fast, and I'm so happy that I have it. I think this is only the beginning, and I would say the sky's the limit, but considering that SpaceX is going to take us to Mars, <laughs> I think it's safe to say there is no limit. And in case anybody from SpaceX is here, I would like to mention that after I hang up my racing suit, I would gladly trade it in for a space suit. <laughs> My name is Leilani Munter, and I am a woman. I am a race car driver and a biologist. I am a political activist and a wife. I am a daughter, a sister, a, and a scuba diver. And while I strive to do each of these things to the betterment of myself, on my very best days, I am a catalyst for change outside of myself. And that is the core reason why I exist. I pledge to each of you today to use my voice as a driver to spread environmental awareness and encourage change as much as I can. As a woman in racing, I must warn you that the odds are stacked against me. If you listen to statistics, as a woman, I am actually, funnily enough, more likely to be, spent, more likely to be sent into space than I am to ever race in the top level of NASCAR. But like the chubby bumblebee that doesn't know it can't fly, I just keep buzzing around. And so I hope that each of you here will be a bumblebee with me. And with our Teslas helping us buzz around this little blue-green planet of ours, together we will change the world. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me.